Well, good morning, and uh, excited to uh, share with you again. And I uh, recognize that there's uh, four different groups enjoying uh, this uh, discussion today. And uh, in preparation for the following week, um, I just want to say that it's going to be a question and answer week. And so um, those who are hearing this uh, after I did it live on Tuesday morning, uh, you should be encouraged to uh, send me uh, your questions so that I can answer your questions on live as well. And so, uh, yeah, so next week is a Q&A week and uh, I will answer the whole time, just your questions. And so work hard to get me questions that you want answered um, and uh, I'll do that next week. So this morning, uh, I want to talk to you about how you became who you are. And uh, this would fall in the uh, in, in, in the broad category of like self-worth, broad category of self-perception, uh, broad category of maybe even soul wounds, and certainly in the category of um, family of origin. Because... We are shaped by the influence of significant others in our life. And depending on how that shaping went, it was um, complicated. Uh, it was difficult. It was maybe even tragic um, or it was empty. It was minimal. It was actually somewhat dysfunctional. Um, and so what happens is I, I want to discuss um, this whole area of life influence and people influence and and how do we deal with some of the complicated things that happened to us um, in our in our growing up and subsequent years, say up to about 18. And so um, we know that some weeks back, I did a talk on your personal worth and what to base your worth on. Now, this is this is not going to explain that again. This is going to actually lead up to that talk if you wanted to go re-listen to that again. But you see, if you begin to understand how you became who you are and the outgrowth of how that affects how you see yourself, um, that's a great step towards recovery because again, often from family boards and stuff, we get soul wounds. And so I want you to get some key truth on three different aspects. I'm just going to give them to you broadly. And then we're going to look at some relational truth that affects us all. And then I'll put it back to you to sort through where you're at in that journey. But first of all, uh, God in his creation said that, all people are worthwhile. All people are precious. All people are valuable. But then individually, he makes us unique. I'll talk about that. So not only am I, by being a creature of God, I am, I am, I'm to be treasured, but I have unique gifts and abilities that uniquely make me me like nobody else. And then the other one is sometimes, even though those are true, there's a sense of worth that is ascribed to me by those closest to me growing up, family of origin mostly. And this comes to me as if that is the truth and challenges the fact that all people are worthy and to be treasured and that I uniquely am gifted and worthy to be treasured. And then I have this overspray where ascribed to me because of negligence or difficult things, I am somehow not able to agree with the fact that all people are worthy and God has given me unique gifts and abilities. So let's, let's look at this. First of all, God's standard of worth to all people. This is true of all God's standard of worth for all people. Right in Genesis one, he, it says that as he was creating along, you know, the end of the first day was this. And he, he looked at all he created and it was good. It was good. It was good. And on the sixth day after he made man, he said it was very good. 
And so, so we got to take from heart that God intended life to us to be a beautiful gift and that it's good. In, in Psalm 139, beautiful passage where it talks about how I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully, <coughs> excuse me, fearfully and wonderfully made. That God created me unique and that all people are have this innate value. All people deserve to be loved and respected because God created us and loves us and has a plan for our lives, as you'll see. But 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 God creates the world and says it's good. He creates humankind and says it's very good. Then he says about you and I that as people, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, I'm always amazed that when I'm holding a seven pound baby, that, that all those anatomy organ things are all working. Like it's just, it's just amazing. You're holding this little kid and uh, Robbie's one of the recent dads here with a three month old Alina. And uh, I mean, he would hold her and, you know, she got complete, you know, cardio system. She got a complete respiratory system. She got a complete, complete, uh, you know, the whole eating system, nutritional system. She got a complete uh, uh, brain system. I mean, it, it's just unbelievable. This little seven, eight pound baby, everything is so functioning. Like we are fearfully, wonderfully made and God doesn't make junk. So, so the standard of worth is all people are worthy of respect. All people are God's design and deserve to be loved. That's God's standard of worth for all people. And that's true of all. But secondly, in God's creation, he, he, he has individual gifting. And so God's creation of individual gifting, I'm different than you. I have gifts that you don't have. You have gifts that I don't have. Uh, we were just chatting earlier. Uh, Roger said, I'm glad you're doing that because <laughs> I'm not very technologically savvy. And I said, neither am I. Uh, but but the point is, some of you, you know, can do all this, you know, stuff. It might be a product of our age and your familiarity and all. But um, but yeah. Um, uh, so, so so keep in mind that your DNA is unique. Eight billion people in the world, and every one of those eight billion people are all one of a kind. Like it's it's crazy how that is even possible, but. You know, if you uh, take a, a follicle of, of a person's hair, if, if you had any, uh, and, and if you, you know, measured that, noted that, um, you know, and, and looked at the, you understand that the DNA is, is, is like a, a map in every cell of the body. When you take one cell and you look at that DNA, it's the same as the next one. And every molecule of my body, whether it's a, a, an earlobe, whether it's a part of my eye, whether it's uh, you know part of my thumb or whatever, uh, the cell has that same DNA throughout. I am one of a kind. You know that's true. Uh, uh, fingerprinting. Um, I'll never forget uh, the opportunity I had. Uh, I went to the uh, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And you might recall, uh, you know, 20 years, well, actually 30 years ago now, but uh, I was likely there 15, 20 years ago, three different times speaking in Northern Ireland in Belfast. And uh, one of my uh, hosts used to be a, a former a police officer um, during the time when the, uh, you know, the IRA, Irish Republican Army, was trying to upset things. <clears throat> and it was a real complicated time. And uh, I, I was allowed, because of his past, to have a tour of the main police station in Belfast. And he took me into one wall, and the wall was, I don't know, 60 feet long and about 10 feet high. They needed chairs to get to the top. But at the time, they actually had alphabetical order, and they had the fingerprints on a card you know, so this is like, you know, L-A to L-M, you know, all of those. And they you would take out and they would find the actual fingerprints of various criminals in Northern Ireland. And 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 I was thinking, like, because when you see a whole wall and he he pulls out one of those little cubby holes and and, you know, there's there's 30 different names all start between, you know, L-A and L-M. Right or whatever. And it, it was very, very interesting because 
that whole wall had thousands. Now, of course, it's all done electronically now, but there was something overwhelming about seeing everybody identified and was unique based on their fingerprints. Right hand, left hand, etc. right? And, and you could be culpable. That means you could be clearly identified and responsible if your fingerprints were at a scene. And you see, see, your fingerprints are unique. Your DNA is unique. And some of you are familiar with um, Nexus, which is uh, an international system where you can uh, go through security because you've been uh, extra tested ahead of time. And um, in having Nexus... Um, I also took the option where they would, they actually recorded my eyes. I looked into this machine, they did it two or three times. And, and uh, then I remember the one time traveling internationally, someplace in Europe, um, uh, the option to use the verification by eye instead of passport was there. So I said, come on, hey, let's go do this. And, you know, take my glasses off, look into this machine. David, Malcolm, Curry, Canada, all the details of my life based on my iris. So your DNA is unique. Your fingerprints are unique. Your iris is unique. You got to understand that God has a very, very, very unique plan for your life because that's way more important than your thumbprint. I mean, you, you, I mean, I mean, God could have created, okay, there's 10 different types of thumbprints. You're, you're a seven, you're a nine, you're a four. And you know, a, a big deal in one sense, except that the whole creation screams one thing, you are unique. And I would argue that God has a very unique plan for your life and he will direct you through that plan. And a part of our journey in life is to, to come to understand who God has created us to be and to live out that destiny so that he wants us to use our gifts and abilities that he gave us to serve him and serve others and to find joy. See, he gives us gifts and abilities so that we can find joy in them. And there's also the physical side of it too, right? Some of you, you know, could lift the back end of a truck. You're so strong. And some of the rest of us were built more for, for speed and running, right? That was my roots, right? Obviously not so much now. But 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 even in Jeremiah 1 uh, 20 or rather 1 5, it, it says that that before conception he knew me. He saw me in the womb and he set me apart and he appointed a unique plan for me. And and just just to know that uh, God has given me a unique life. I am unique to one point, that's actually 8.01 billion people i looked it up last night to make sure because i used to say seven and a half i'm off for a bit and uh but god gave you gifts and capabilities no one has your unique slate of abilities nobody in the world and and uh you know people might look similar to you but once you get to know people like uh i just was in uh Warren's house recently and I met his twins he said you know I'd like you to take you a couple hours to see the difference between my twins Actually, it was quite easy, Warren. To be fair, uh, I, 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 boy, great kids too. And but, but, but the idea that even identical twins, you can quickly see the variations, and and so so because we have this unique gift. You see, all are to be treasured, all are to be loved and respected. That's the the general standard of worth for all people, as God has created us and saw that we were good. But then. <laughs> He creates unique gifts and abilities and makes you such a unique individual that nobody is like you. And, and, and so we are to rest in the fact that I'm a person of worth and I'm a unique creature that nobody's like me. And that gives me a unique place in this world that nobody else is like me. That's the foolish thing of why it's dumb for you to copy somebody else. The, 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 well, yes, I know we admire people and we want to model a life after, you know, gifted people with great character. That's different. But then we try to, I mean, you know, in those teen years when, you know, uh, when, when, when people dress alike, try to look alike and, and somehow there's greater affinity and he, he is, uh, strength interpersonally because I must be okay because I'm dressed just like them. 
I remember back in the 80s when I was starting my youth ministry, it was hilarious because it was their time that long hair for girls, but then they had these, these amazing high, um, I don't know, they sprayed them. They, the, the bangs, instead of being like this, went up and they were just, whoa, right? And you come into a, a room and there's all these, there's five or six, whoa! And I'm thinking, what a heck? I mean, I, they thought it was uh, attractive because everybody was doing it, but it was kind of, uh, I'll tell you what, the, the spray companies sure liked it because they used likely a third of a bottle of spray just to get those five inch things uh, standing straight up in the air. But God created us all <coughs> as people of worth. And then he creates us individually with unique abilities, talents, and gifts. And that's uniquely true of you. Now, here's where it gets complicated. How do we get so off track and feeling low about ourselves? How do we get so off track feeling like uh, we're not worth something? How do we get so off track if, if God created all good and he created me with these amazing gifts and abilities, then, then, then what's this? How, how did this all happen? I want to talk about what I call relational truth. And, uh, and there's five statements here that I've highlighted in the middle of the handout that I want to process with you. Listen to this. Life is relationships. Good ones free you. Bad ones imprison you. You see, 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 life is our connections to others. Relationships. And it starts with our family of origin, primarily our mom and dad, our siblings, then our cousins and friends, etc. But life is all about relationships. And good relationships free you to be who God created you to be. And bad relationships imprison you into a misguided view of who you are. Secondly, you are the sum total of those who have loved you or refused to love you. You are the sum total of those who have loved you or those who have refused to love you. So, so though I am a person of worth and should be loved and respected as God created all that way, then I'm a unique person, even born into this family, where I should be loved, affirmed, etc. If somehow there's been a withholding of love, if somehow there's been a, um, you know, neglect or just, you know, problems or, um, you know, uh, harshness or whatever, um, that impacts how you see yourself. It's almost like the real people who are supposed to be extension of God's love to you as parents. It impacts you and you become something less of what God intended because of those people in your world. So you are the sum total of those who have loved you or refused to love you. Three, again, life is relationships from start to finish, birth to death. You can't duck the influence of your people. You can't duck the influence of your people. See, no matter how gifted a person is and no matter how valued God sees them, if the people working close to them convey to them that they're unworthy, they're unloved, they're uh, a problem, they're in the way, uh, they don't have time for them, those kind of things, then, then God's standard of worth and God's individual gifting to you is is oversprayed by this sad influence of your people, the people that you were closest to. And so, yeah, life is relationships from start to finish, birth to death. You can't duck the influence of people. I tell parents, I says, listen, you are going to influence your kid. You are modeling to your kid. So either going to be good influence or bad influence, a good model, good example, or a bad example. But there's no there's no questions. You are an example. You are modeling. You are an influence. So, fourthly, in this relational truth section here, freedom begins with the courage to double check if your family of origin was normal or not. Because you see, what happens is every kid thinks that their family is normal. That that's this is what this is what families are. This is, this is, my family is my standard of what truth is. 
And so uh, I remember this is this is a, a fun story and actually implies some pretty nice things about my uh, my wife and I as parents. But when our oldest daughter went to the University of Calgary and uh, she had a, a weekend free, uh, sometimes we'd fly her home and and uh, and and she said it was so different because the other kids at university that you know like she was in calgary and we were in abbotsford uh you know they didn't have much relationship with their parents and uh so she said yeah yeah i'm going home uh, to see my family and one of her friends said you, you mean you're going home to see all your friends and your family's paying for it nice job and she said no no i'm gonna actually go see my family i really like my family and the girl had this this dumbfounded look like what uh come on come on and Jody later told us, she says, dad, it's the weirdest thing. Like, it's it's the weirdest thing. Like, people, you know, want to go home, you know, a spring break or whatever, because they want to see their friends. But, you know, the yeah, I just want to come home, mom and dad. But they really are saying at school, they don't really want to see their family. And uh, and she said, dad, I, I just find this so interesting that I actually like to be with you, mom. And uh it was interesting. Uh, the, the, sometime that first semester, I was speaking in Calgary. So I, I was able to spend a, a day with my daughter. I flew in a day early. And I actually went to class, university class, and sat beside my daughter, went to about three or four classes. And she was introducing me to her friends. And, you know, and, and of course, some teachers, you know, maybe only a class of 30 and kind of, who's that older guy back there? You know, obviously a dad. And she said, oh, this is my dad. He's here today. And so I just brought him to my class as well. Welcome, Mr. Curry and all this. Right. And she was quite proud to introduce me around. Well, you see, that's a very interesting type of influence of the family. And you see, you have to decide by double checking whether your family of origin was normal or not, or what kind of liabilities or dysfunction you have. And it's certainly that not that I didn't have any liabilities in my upbringing, and I'm sure if my daughter Rana, she could list a number of liabilities that we passed on to her. One of which, uh, you know, she is Dave Curry with hair, so she's twisted and driven and everything. So uh, we can't we can't undo that mess. But uh, let's go to number five. Again, life is relationships, and some spend their life trying to undo the impact of negative ones. You see, once you start to sense that, gee, I, I don't think that was good. I don't think that was healthy. I don't think that was norm. But to you, it was norm. So until you go outside your family of origin and start to see other families and ask questions and hear people talk, hear a talk like this, you go, hmm, maybe I did have some, some issues there. Because if your dad was angry and distant and was always cutting you down and, you know, everything was not good enough and, and you fell short again and they didn't have time for you. They were busy with work. And when you asked for time and they would do things, like, well, don't be stupid. I got a job to do. I don't have time to hang out with you. You know, that type of stuff. Right. Uh, or just maybe they didn't say it. They just were absent. Right. You see, so, so some people, first of all, have to double check if their family of origin was normal or not, but, but then th they may have to spend their life trying to undo the impact of the negative ones. And the sooner you step into the role, uh, oh, sorry, the journey of addressing and, 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 and refocusing and reshaping how you view yourself uh, different than your family of origin, uh, that is significant. And finally, overcoming your past Whatever it is, whatever um, whatever impacted you from your family of origin, which we're going to look at next. Overcoming your past is a far better path than denying it, repeating it, blaming others for it, and frankly, passing on the same thing to your kids. And that's where that's where you have to, for sure, try to address your stuff and the baggage that you receive from your family of origin, or else you end up passing that on to your kids without even trying. Because if you take that as normal, how you were raised, and you turn it to the next generation and treat the next generation there, but your world was dysfunctional, then you're actually passing on dysfunction. 
And I've said many times, dysfunction breeds dysfunction. And you and I have to take responsibility to work through whatever family of origin baggage we have so that we can be free to, one, recognize that we're part of God's standard of worth for all people. We deserve to be loved and respected and what God created was good. And two, we are uniquely gifted individually gifted i'm one of a eight billion in the world then god has a plan for me with gifts and abilities and desires for me to express those so there's the six principles of relational truth that are going to anchor us as we go into the last section here see what happens is sometimes because of the nature of the calamity and issues that parents have had they end up passing on a, a twisted or an incomplete declaration of worth. And it's spoken as true over you, or it's something that you, you acquiesce, you absorb the sense of unworthiness. You absorb the sense of that um, not good enough. See, so your family born origin, your parents especially, they shape how you see yourself. People that you rely on. Maybe they're inadequate as parents and they're insufficient as role models. And, and uh, you know, maybe they had a difficult upbringing and they didn't deal with it. So they just end up repeating the same kind of patterns. It's not uncommon to have those patterns repeated over and over again. And so these parents that you rely on may have that dysfunctional upbringing that they're passing on to you. And one principle that I teach, I just taught it uh, Friday in Brooks, Alberta. Um, but parents are like a mirror. Okay. Like, like a mirror. If I'm holding my phone as if it's a mirror, um, recognize that that mirror reflects back an image of who I am. So as it were, if this is the mirror now, um, the parent is holding this mirror towards the child but the parent's words and actions and tone towards the child is reflecting to the child who they are. You are loved. You are gifted. <laughs> you're, you're valued. I like being with you. Do you understand what that does to a kid? And then, then, they, then they start to take on a sense of worth because those primary influences are saying things that they are a person of worth. They are significant. They are loved. They are cared for. And so we are like a mirror as a parent and we reflect to that young child who they are. Uh, three month old Alina, Robbie's daughter. And uh, he's going to love and cherish her. I know he does already. It's a beautiful thing when a person has a child and, and, and you have this, unbelievable new capacity to love this unique little creature so robbie as he shows love to her and and, and cares for her and and spends time with her and, and 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 makes an effort to extend care to her and hugs her and 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 all kinds of loving interactions with her and grows up and ends up coaching her soccer and and cheering for her at her piano lesson and, and uh, you know, going on trips with her and, and doing father-daughter dates. The, the whole story that a great father would do, which I'm sure he will do, tells that little girl something. And it confirms what God says is true in the first place, that she is loved. So he is Alina's mirror. And she begins to believe who she is because of how she has been loved. But sometimes, instead of being loved and encouraged, many are ignored, sometimes rejected, or even worse, abused. And you can add a whole host of words there. And so, um, yeah, uh, there's where this twisted declaration of worth, because it actually implies, well, I mustn't be worth anything because the way they talk to me, they treat me, they don't time for me, etc. So I'm, you know, I'm like a candy wrapper, I can be thrown away. And so either failed attachment, attachment is bonding between parent and child, either failed attachment or fractured attachment, self doubt sets in. Not a strong sense of worth. But self-doubt sets in. 
And this dysfunction around you skews your view of who you are. Skew, twists, messes up your view of who you are. And so whether it's harsh treatment or neglect, it erodes the sense of worth that God wants you to enjoy. And that's the soul wounds we talk about. And some of the greatest soul wounds are the family of origin things. Now, there's also soul wounds that we cause ourselves because from 14 to 24, you may make decisions that are not your best and you end up hurting yourself by the actions that you carried out. But, but their harsh treatment and their neglect erodes a sense of worth that God wants you to enjoy. See, parents are to build into their children a clear picture of their worth before God. That's one of the responsibilities of parents. And I would also argue that parents are to display a consistent, caring, encouraging disposition to each child. Because that reflects the heart of God. That reflects God's love for humankind and God's love for you, the individual. And just, uh, I mean... I just grabbed one scripture here. I mean, I, I teach exactly on this. I did Friday night and, you know, I must have had 10 or 12 scripture here. But just just to let you know, uh, when, when Paul was speaking to the Thessalonians he, and he said, I dealt with you just like a caring father deals with his own children. So he's telling them, I'm kind of like a spiritual father. and I'm, I'm going to care for you. Like, like a father cares for his kids. So it's telling us how a father is supposed to care to, for his kids because Paul is doing it right as he cares for these spiritual children. And notice the words. As a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging. Urging is kind of, come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. You see, encouraging. Good job, son. Well done. Comforting. It's okay when you struggle and fail. And urging you to live lives worthy of God. So I ask you this question. How did you become who you are? Keep in mind that God has this amazing standard of worth for all people. That all people are created good. And we deserve to be loved and respected. God doesn't make junk. That's true of us all. But then secondly... In God's creation plan, each of us are unbelievably uniquely gifted with gifts, abilities, capabilities, and, 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 and you're unique. But then that particular set of truths, those two could be confirmed by your family of origin, your human experience that you are loved, respected, treasured, gifted, uh, backed, believed in, encouraged, comforted, you are that, or you have some kind of twisted presentation of who you are. As parents hold up the mirror, it says you're inadequate, you're not good enough, uh, I, wish, uh, I, I wish you never were born, and all kinds of tragic things like that. So I ask you, Overcoming your past is a far nobler path than denying it, repeating it, or blaming others for it, and certainly not passing it on to the next generation. My challenge would be that you would base your worth on who God says you are and not on a possible dysfunctional family of origin. I hope that makes sense. May God guide you in this journey of personal recovery because it does connect to your addiction.